Welcome to Ciao Bella, hosted by me, Erica Firpo, a travel journalist based in Rome. Each episode of Ciao Bella, I sit down with Italy's creators, contemporary artists and artisans, designers, culinary experts, heritage brands, and innovative estites, and more who are defining and redefining 21st century Italy. Pull up a chair and join in. Hey, welcome to Travel Bites. Today, I have my friend Sara Pavancello with me, and I'm very excited. Sara, hey, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I know you're in Rome. You're on the other side of Rome, but I'm really happy to have you here because I want to talk about something I really love eating, and I know you know quite a bit about it. But before we talk about it, I thought it would be fun to let everybody know Not that you're my friend, because now everybody knows that, but a little bit about who you are. So I'm going to give a quick introduction. Sara is a tour guide based in Rome. And how many, you're like a million generations Roman, right? Yes. Yes, I am. (laughs) Because my ancestors from my father's side arrived in Rome by the times of uh, Titus when uh, Titus destroyed the, the temple of Jerusalem and actually conquered Jerusalem. So uh, more than two millennia, almost uh, two millennia ago. And uh, my mother's side, uh, uh, ancestors came in Rome from Sicily because of the Spanish Inquisition uh, in 1492. So yes, long time ago, my ancestors came here. So you are more Roman than probably any Roman I know. And I'd love to know, what's your specialty as a guide? I'm a tour guide specialized in Jewish tours of Rome. So I sh- the, the tour that I love the most is the, the ghetto tour, well, during which I show my clients the great synagogue, the ghetto area, the Jewish museum. And uh, I also lead tours such as the, the ancient Rome from a Jewish perspective, like the Colosseum, which is the connection between Jewish history and the Colosseum. So I also show the Roman forums, uh, Arch of Titus. So let's say the, the regular tour, but looking, uh, doing it uh, with, from a Jewish perspective. That's what I usually do. But I think a lot of people, they don't realize that the ghetto, uh, the neighborhood, the ghetto, which is actually where I live, is, um, you know, it's it's an it was named for it was I think it became a ghetto what, in the in the late 1500s. But it's been the home to the Jewish community for almost, what, 1500 years. Let's say that there are proofs of the fact that Jewish people lived in the ghetto before the ghetto experience. The ghetto experience started. You're right because the ghetto experience started in 1555, because Pope Paul IV Carafa, uh, in a certain way, he decided that it was awkward the Jewish people lived with uh, with the rest of people. So he started establishing ghettos all over, uh, all over the Vatican. And the first one he created was the one of Rome in 1555. And uh, before that, the Jews lived uh, in Trastevere area, but there are uh, proofs of the fact that Jewish people moved to uh, the ghetto area at least 100 years, 150 years before the ghetto was created. And nowadays uh, is the center for Jewish of Jewish life. It's like the Jewish community center, even if we don't live there anymore. <laughs> One of the things that I I love about the ghetto, I love I love the ghetto in general, and, and not just because I live here, but I love the history, I love the architecture, and I love the community. But in particular, I I like to eat, and at least once a week, I get something called the pizza ebraica, and I would this is the travel bite that I've been dying to talk about because I call it my my Roman Jewish power bar. It is so incredible, mm-hmm. and I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about it. So first of all. Uh, the the pizza the real name is not pizza ebraica, and everybody knows uh, uh, the pizza as the pizza ebraica, but the real name is pizza di beride. And uh, do you know what beride means? No, what does that oh, mean? For sure, I I knew that you don't, uh, don't know. You cannot know why, because beride is one of the few words words that are left. Uh, from the Judaico-Romanesco, and Judaico-Romanesco is the Jewish Roman slang that Jews of Rome use and are still using. 
And so it's like uh, Yiddish for Ashkenazi Jews, it's like Ladino for uh, Sephardi Jews. So let's say it's a mix of Italian words with Hebrew words. And Beride comes from Bris, Brit Mila. So what does it mean? It means that the pizza ebraica is the pizza de Beride because it's the pizza that we eat every time we have a celebration in life. And uh, the first celebration uh, um, in Jewish life is the Brit Mila, so it's the circumcision. So the night before the circumcision of the baby boy, uh, we have a big celebration uh, with uh, friends, uh, family, and uh, whoever we know. And uh, what, it's set, what it's served on the table is the pizza di Beride, that everybody uh, names uh, the pizza ebraica, but actually the real name is pizza de beride. Now let's let's tell everybody because I wish everybody could could see it. Um, let's describe what it's like because I think the word pizza is a little misleading for most people that don't live in Italy because um, it's not pizza. It's not what you Americans are thinking. <laughs> no, no, that's what I always say when I'm. Uh, when I lead the tour, because one of the stops in my tour is uh, the, the bakery, the Boccione bakery. And uh, everybody thinks that the pizza ebraica is uh, something with uh, tomato and mozzarella or uh, something like that, but it's not. <laughs> it's a kind of giant biscuit. Uh, and uh, it's not a, a simple one, because uh, it's a mix of uh, uh, sugar, uh, uh, flour and also raisin, candied fruit, uh, pine nuts, almonds mix all together. So and uh, then cooked in the oven for I think at least uh, almost one hour. And uh, if I have to be honest, uh, the the specific ingredients uh, are a kind of secret. Nobody really knows uh, which are the real ingredients uh, of this pizza because that's actually the secret of the Boccione family, because Boccio, the owners of Boccione family are just women uh, who belong to the same family, and they don't share their recipes with anybody but with members of their own family. So I can tell you a bunch of almonds, a bunch of sugar, but I cannot tell you the exact uh, amount, considering uh, that if you... Mm, if you check on the internet or if you ask uh, to my grandma or to my mom or to whoever, nobody really knows the real recipe, but everybody knows the own version of the recipe. Since the, the, the owners of the bakery, uh, they never shared it uh, with anybody else. Do you know how long Boccioni has been there? How long have they, this? They told me from uh, three, 300 years ago. 300 oh. years ago, they start, their family started the business. I had that. I had no idea. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I, we should give everybody, it's, it's a little, it's a tiny little bakery on, on a corner. And, um, when you see the pizza ebraica, it's cut into like long rectangles and it, you know, it's, it looks a little burnt on the top for me. I used to, you know what I used to do? I used to get it first thing in the morning. And it's about as long as my hand, maybe a little bit, not quite as wide. And I would eat it literally all day long because I, the consistency of the, you know, the, the fruits, the candy fruits, the nuts and the, the impasto, the breadish kind of, it's not bread. It's like that biscuit quality. It lasts. So you could eat it like you could have one and it could last you all day if you, if you were running around and you didn't have time for a meal because it's like a solid, I mean, it's got everything. It's got the sugars, it's got the protein. I mean, to me, it's perfect. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's delicious. It's really delicious. And um, actually, I always suggest to have it in the morning or in the afternoon, not uh, not to have it like uh, half an hour before your lunch, because then you will not have lunch. Uh, exactly. <laughs> one hour before dinner? No, absolutely not. Uh, take it as a dessert, because if you have it, you will not eat anything else. Now I know that um, I know that the the Bocconi family, like all of the ghetto, keeps Sabbath. So it's it's the kind you know this is the kind of place in Rome. First of all, that there there'll always be a line at this bakery, and it's closed Friday afternoons through through Sundays. Is that correct? Uh, through Saturday and uh, on Sunday, actually, it's open. 
and um, actually Sunday it's the busiest day because on, on Sunday locals have the time to stand on a line and take the and uh, have the pizza. Um, so if you come on a Sunday on a Sunday morning, uh, you will see a line that starts right in front of the bakery and ends uh, on the other side of the street just to have the pizza and uh, uh, the other delicious biscuits and uh, cakes that they do have that they sell in the bakery. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I know they have a lot of other things. Can you tell everybody else? Can you give some some suggest suggestions, but some ideas of what else they have? Yeah, so first of all, we have to consider one historical information that in 1610, so during the two times, uh, the Pope uh, realized that he couldn't, so let's say, let's talk about the ghetto. So the ghetto was an open prison for the Jews, uh, and so the Jews couldn't do whatever they wanted. So there were many restrictions for the Jews. Uh, and uh, among the restrictions, the popes, uh, popes through the centuries uh, didn't want them to celebrate, uh, to have a celebration for every bris milah, every bar mitzvah, every wedding, etc. But in 1610, uh, the pope realized that he couldn't stop the Jews uh, from celebrating. And so he decided that, yes, they could celebrate, but they could celebrate just having uh, mostacholis, uh, so biscuits. So if you will ever uh, go to this bakery, you will realize that the, the most of the uh, items that they sell look like biscuits or giant biscuits. Uh, they don't have uh, the, yes, they do have the croissant, but just in particular moments of the, of the year. But what they sell, it's like uh, biscuits with cinnamon and almonds, uh, or um, big cakes that look like giant biscuits, uh, such as, for example, the ricotta cheesecake. Oh, yes. And, I love that. Uh, yeah, and it's delicious. Uh, there is the version uh, with the chocolate that I'm in love with, but there is also the one uh, with ricotta and bichole, so uh, cheese and, um, and cherries. And they also have the ginetti, so be, uh, big biscuits or plain biscuits or with raisin or with uh, also with big pieces of uh, dark chocolate inside. And these are, uh, uh, these are a, a few, like, let's say it's a tiny little, little bakery and they don't sell uh, 100 different kinds of biscuits or, or cakes. So they have just five, seven items, uh, seven kinds of uh, uh, cakes and biscuits, uh, and that's what they sell. And uh, I know that the ricotta cheesecake uh, is the newest uh, uh, invention uh, of the family, and uh, it dates back almost uh, 70 years ago, 70, 80 years ago. It's the newest thing. Even if <laughs> also, the, yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine? And uh, I can tell that I've grown up in the ghetto. And when I was a baby girl, my my grandfather took me, like uh, gave me the merenda, so the snack in the afternoon, and um, always gave me the, the ginetto that was plain when I was a baby girl. I'm 31, so we are talking about 25 years ago. Let's say that till eight years ago, uh, the ginettis uh, were just plain. It's just a few years uh, that they decided to add chocolate or, uh, or uh, raisin in the in the ginetti, so in the biscuits. But uh, the the biscuits with cinnamon and almonds uh, is something that uh, dates back uh, hundreds of years ago, like the the pizza di bride, the same the same thing. Wow, this is this is what I love about that bakery. It's like it's got tons and tons of stories that you have to ask people like you <laughs> to find out. Yeah. Well, Sara, thank you so much for joining me. I'd love for you to share with people how they can find you um, for your website, for example. So I usually uh, I they. I usually have people who reach me through Facebook, through my Facebook page uh, and uh, my Facebook account, it's Sara Pavoncello. And uh, my website is, uh, I'm working on my website. I take the advantage of the quarantine uh, working on uh, my <laughs> website. <laughs> and um, or also on Instagram or on my telephone number through WhatsApp. 
And uh, can I can I say can I tell you my telephone number or uh, well, why don't you... we do this? Why don't I share all your information? Um, We'll share your 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 Instagram page, which is or your Instagram profile, which is Sara Pavancello. Roma, and, yes. Roma, that's right. And what we'll do is for all you listeners, if you go to the podcast notes to my podcast page on my website, the one specifically for this travel bite, I'm going to have all of Sara's details and and more, and details also about this delicious treat. Thank you, Sara, for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Ciao Bella. If you'd like to know more about today's guest, please visit ciaobella.co and click on the podcast link or go directly to ciaobella.co backslash podcast. Want more Italy? You can find all my episodes on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher. When you have time, subscribe to iTunes and rate the podcast. What are you waiting for? And if you want to be part of the podcast, email me or DM me your Italy questions. To learn more about me and my work, go to my website, ericafirpo.com, and follow my Italy adventures on Instagram at ericafirpo. Ciao, Bella! And a very big thank you and hug to Massimiliano Yonta and Dis to Dis Studios, the producers of Ciao, Bella, who continue to make me sound and feel great.